Welcome in Zero to 60, I'm Brie Maestas, that's Matt McChesney. I'm only gonna be on for a couple of minutes here before we welcome our guests to the show, but I wanted to jump right into it, give us our title sponsor of the show, and that of course is Bet Online with the NFL playoffs right around the corner and the NBA season in full swing. Bet Online has you covered with all the up-to-date and up-to-second odds, news, and scores right at your fingertips with additional odds, lines, trends, and info on both desktop and mobile. You can access the world's best wagering information at any time, head on over there today to get on in on the action and see all the updated odds. Remember to use our promo code that's believe B L E A V to receive your 50% off welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet line where the game starts. And the game started, we had a full slate of NFL games, and we have two more today. Uh, I want to jump right into it with the Texans and the Browns because hmm, it looks like, just as I said, Flacco was another flash in the pan. And I know Matt hates it when I say that. But guess what? That's what it panned out to be. He looked exactly like the quarterback he's been his entire career, which is above average at best. And the last time we saw him at that rate was in 2012. So, Matt, go ahead, take the floor. Tell me why I'm wrong. But Flacco didn't look anything special against C.J. Stroud and the Texans. Uh, yeah, I mean, the day was definitely won by Houston. They looked fantastic. And D'Amico Ryans, you got to tip your cap to him and C.J. Stroud. They are the, fir- the youngest combo. Uh, and one of only three uh, rookie head coach, rookie quarterback combos to ever win a playoff game. So that's pretty big time. Took advantage of the home crowd. Uh, Cleveland looked lethargic. They looked bad. You know, Flacco, that back-to-back pick sixes that, you know, put the game out of reach. Um, And Houston took a personal that they were being picked against, you know, just everywhere. I picked against them, everybody did. So, uh, you know, Flacco hit the hit the I don't know 18 year wall or whatever it is, uh, and looked pretty bad, but so did the entire team. Um, see what they do in Cleveland moving forward. I'm sure that Deshaun Watson will be the guy moving forward there. I can't imagine they'll roll with Joe, but maybe keep him as the backup. You never know. Uh, so he can mentor the next quarterback. Well, I don't know if you want. I don't think there's any mentoring Deshaun Watson there, but um, <clears throat> we'll say this. Cleveland, if they can stay healthy, I wonder what a healthy Cleveland Browns team looks like uh, because they are so damn talented, but they are hurt constantly. I mean, they've got more injuries to deal with every year than it seems anybody. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you, going back to the victors here at Houston, they look good, and they're going to be either walking into Baltimore with an opportunity to spring a, a, an upset or, you know, if, if things go crazy today and, and Pittsburgh finds a way to beat Buffalo – uh, in, in the elements up there in Orchard Park, you know, or, or they could potentially be, you know, going to Kansas City. So both Kansas City or Baltimore, uh, Houston's not screwing around. CJ Stroud can play. Talking about injured teams, the Miami Dolphins, and I'm not going to say this is just solely related to injuries, but they hobbled uh, into the game against the Chiefs, and ultimately the Chiefs won out. It doesn't look like a whole lot of teams stand in the way of a less than elite Chiefs squad heading into kind of a run towards the Super Bowl. I don't know who's going to slow down the Chiefs. I thought the Dolphins stood the best chance. Mike McDaniel wasn't able to combat uh, the talent that we presently see there. So the Dolphins have Tua. Tua wasn't able to get it done. But there's a little bit of a, I guess, a murmur online that McDaniel had somehow given up on Tua. And I don't think that that's necessarily the case because that's the quarterback that's gotten you this far. Just unfortunately, the Dolphins weren't able to stand up in the brutal cold. Um, don't love the narrative that the Chiefs are back, but they're, but they're able to get it done. Uh, Mahomes cracks a helmet, kind of the, the bitter cold and, and bitter reality check here for NFL fans as they continue to roll through the playoffs. Matt, how do you feel about the Dolphins Chiefs game? Um, look, it, the elements were what they were. Everybody's got a plane. I mean, it, it wasn't snowing, but it was damn cold. Um, the wind wasn't really much of a factor. I thought Miami you know, Miami's cute when they have to play good teams and they, they get their ass kicked a lot. They're not very competitive against the good football teams in the NFL, whereas Kansas City, that's what they do. They beat good teams. And they've had uh, ups and downs this year. But when it comes down to it, they have Andy Reid, they have a good defense, and they've always got 15. And 15 gives you an opportunity to win whenever he's on the field. So, uh, yeah, they. it looks like Kansas City is on a road to the AFC title game. But at the same time, 
that divisional round game, if they have to go to Orchard Park and play Buffalo, Buffalo already beat them at home uh, in Arrowhead this year. That's why they have to travel. Uh, that will be a monumentally big game as Buffalo and Kansas City have met in the playoffs so many times. I, I imagine that's what's going to happen. Baltimore is a better team than Kansas City, uh, but Baltimore has got to overcome the you know the the fact that they haven't played well in the playoffs in the past with Lamar Jackson. So they have to go out and win their divisional game against Houston. It looks like they're going to play and you know host the AFC title game, whether that's Buffalo or Kansas City, whichever team makes it out, out of the divisional round there, you know, I, I think Baltimore's still better than everybody, but they've got to prove it. So the one thing about the AFC playoffs is Patrick Mahomes has done it so many times that at some point you just look at everybody else that's alive and you go, well, Kansas City's still there. And it just seems like they always hang around, just hanging around. And uh, look, Miami – Miami needs home, home playoff games. That's what they need. They, with, the more they have to go on – last year they had to go on the road in Orchard Park. It wasn't terribly – you know, it wasn't terrible from a weather perspective, but it was still a, home, a road playoff loss with a third-string quarterback. This year they had to go on the road and play in negative 30-degree weather. So if Miami wants to win some playoff games, maybe they should finish the season correctly and not shit down their leg with – up three games with five games to play. I mean, that's that's a pretty monumental collapse. B. King wants to know, is it a mindset or coaching thing with Miami uh, needing to be tougher? It's Tua as the quarterback. And McDaniel has every right to feel that he needs a real quarterback. They're not going to extend him. He's not worth $60 million a year or whatever the number is going to be for the next guy that's up. You know, if, if Dak is making $50 million next year and he's that average, you know, what's Tua worth? He's not worth that. That's damn sure. So you don't want to hamstring your franchise by giving all that money to Tua because he doesn't, he's not that guy. He's a game manager, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with being a game manager, but he's far from elite. Um, and I, I understand the elements were awful the other day, but it didn't seem to bother 15. So my, my point is if you're going to look at the Dolphins and say, what are they missing? They're missing a big-time quarterback in crunch time. He's really, again, two is just like the team, really good against average competition, really average against elite competition. So I, I think that the problem is the quarterback. I mean, but you, you're seeing it when you have a lot of average quarterbacks presently in the league. Russell Wilson got his paycheck, and now you're seeing how that's panning out for the Denver Broncos. I just wonder – it, did it reset the market entirely when those big uh, contracts started coming down? You have Daniel Jones making a ridiculous amount of money. Where did it stop? Because I don't think you can uh, uh, stop it in his tracks after it's been started. It's like a runaway train right now. Yeah, and I agree, Bree. And, and look, it, at some point it's got to stop, though, because you can't, you, you can't just say that the guy is worth the money because he's next in line to get paid. Mm -hmm. You know, like at some point you have to actually be paid for what you are, not paid for what you could be. And there's a lot of, you know, like, you know, cautionary tales in, in the International Football League of paying guys and then not getting a lot out of it. I've heard Cousins of his massive, you know, fully guaranteed contract with the Vikings. Did they get bang on the buck for that? Did they get return on investment for that? Dak Prescott, his huge contract that they get return on investment for that. I'm not saying they didn't, but I also am not saying they did. So, you know, Kansas City gave Mahomes a $500 million contract. He's won multiple Super Bowls. But if you look at San Francisco, Brock Purdy's on a rookie deal. They're the number one seed. But if you look at Baltimore, you have Lamar negotiating his own $250 million contract. They're the one seed. But is that the price of doing business? Because it is. because Brock Purdy may or may not turn out to be someone that the, the team wants to extend, or they'll redraft and they'll have to start all over. I think the idea is that until you know and until you need, it's a supply and demand issue. Yeah, and, and look, the ability to draft a quarterback in the first round and ride that guy for five years on a rookie contract, that's a good thing. That's, that's something you want to do in the National Football League, but – that's what Miami should do. They either need to go find a bridge quarterback for a year or just use Tua as that bridge and maybe draft the first rounder this year and let Tua walk. And it's the business of football. I mean, 
look, man, no one does it better than the Green Bay Packers, the business of the quarterback position. That's mm -hmm. what we're going to talk with Mike Sanford about when he comes on at 10-15. You know, as he coached Jordan Love at Utah State, and he's a quarterback coach and guru, and I can't wait to have him on, but it, it's the business of football, Bree. Like, if, if the quarterback is going to take up so much of your cap, it's almost irresponsible to have that guy on your roster unless he's Tom Brady-esque. And even Tom Brady, the great Tom Brady, was at the middle of the road when it came to salaries. Because he, 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 he always would take, took less he money. He would always take less always money. take less money so they could go spend more on the team. So I'm, I'm not saying that's what players need to do. That's I get what it. they do but need to do. The quarterbacks, the, not every player, because every position doesn't get paid like quarterbacks. Well, Mahomes is going to need to do it sooner rather than later that's because then he doesn't totally, have anybody to throw to. I totally agree with you 100%. You absolutely, if you're a quarterback in this league and you're look like, for example, if Russell Wilson would have taken – half the money this year and they would have been able to go spend more maybe they would have had different outcomes in games like it, you don't know what an extra player or you know an extra asset can do because the quarterback's making too much money if he's sucking up the entire salary cap so or a draft pick to, to draft shake pick. a stick at. exactly so you know it's it's quarterbacks that understand if they humble themselves from a from a financial standpoint but also from a you know if you're a good quarterback, you're always displacing like the praise. So if if, right. it's, if you do a good job on the field and everyone wins, it's because everybody else did a great job to support you. And if you did a bad job and the team loses as a good quarterback, you need to walk in and then shoulder the blame. Look, it was on me. I did a shitty job. I'm the leader. It all falls on me. That's what good quarterbacks do, man. They always they either. Shovel the praise or shoulder the load. And that's that's what you don't see a lot in today's National Football League, to be completely honest with you. To be completely honest, um, I want to get to this one, too, from B. King, and then I want to get to a couple of the other games before Mike gets on. But uh, B. King said, would less guaranteed and offering bonuses for performances be a solution? I think there's a it's a good idea, but yeah. they do that all right. There's contract incentives in there. But I think the idea of offering up front is this runaway train, like I mentioned earlier, of getting those big-time contracts in a time of need when you don't even have a secondary quarterback on your bench to write out the season. So I think it's a dangerous uh, – prerogative here that teams are are just having having to make these decisions uh the walter penner group was put into a predicament uh with russell wilson and then the idea of offering bonuses russell wilson got to kind of uh construct his contract the way that he saw fit which included those injury designations and clauses and the team was pretty much hamstrung because they needed a quarterback and then they needed a coach. So uh, these teams set themselves up for failure. It's not necessarily the contract. Uh, but Matt and I were talking before the show of like needing to draft early and often so that you have quarterbacks in the helm so that oh, they yes. can really uh, percolate in the system. You're seeing that with Jordan Love. I can't wait to listen to that conversation between Mike and Matt as they discuss that. But I also wanted to throw out here that uh, I think last week I said that at this present moment, if you took away Aaron Rodgers' injury, that I would want Jordan Love at the helm over Aaron Rodgers. And we saw exactly why as he continued to ball and show exactly what happened as he sat behind Aaron Rodgers for years and the Green Bay Packers continue to win at every opportunity at the quarterback position. Maybe not in general, but it's been interesting to see. And I love to hear that conversation, Matt, between you and Mike when he jumps on the show. But before we, I get off here and before Mike jumps on, and I'll introduce him here in a little bit, I want to talk about how freaking cool it is that the Detroit Lions, after 32 years, were able to do what they did. Eminem in attendance. It was all Detroit all the time. You know, uh, the retribution for Jared Goff to come in and be able to have his vengeance against McVay, to see Matthew Stafford prove why he's not a Hall of Fame. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to go that far. I just wanted to see if your eyes would light up. He is, a Hall of Fame. He is not a yes, Hall of Fame. No, Matt Stafford is not a Hall of Fame quarterback. Yes. So is Joe Flacco. Joe Flacco is not them. a Hall of Fame yes, No, they are not. Oh. You are being ridiculous. Okay, well, I'm not gonna I don't even get to get into this conversation well, with you. Look, look, the Detroit, the Detroit game, and, and you bring up a great point that it was all it, of my points are great. Well, this is also true. Uh, but I will say this: it was a monumental night for Detroit. It was it's I'm glad they won. 24-23, you know, that there's some questionable calls. Matt Stafford looked, I don't know, 
let, let's put yourself in it like the the shoes of the refs. Would you have stopped the game and taken Matt Stafford out when he got his head broken? Yes, because there's a, why is there no concussion protocol in the playoffs? I, I'm like tremendously upset by it because if you want to preach player safety and yeah. you want to talk about tackling, but you're not going to stop the goddamn game when Matthew Stafford gets his head rocked, you could tell on the field when he I'm when he came to exactly. But no, we're not going to do that. We're also going to let Patrick Mahomes take his helmet off in the middle of the game and not make him sit out of play because the rules don't apply when it's against the ratings and all of that bullshit. But the time has come, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome our guest to the show, Coach Mike Sanford, two-time Rose Bowl coach and formerly the offensive coordinator and QB coach at Utah State and Colorado. I'm bringing him on the show, and I'm going to hop off because there's not enough, you know, airtime for all of us to be on this show. And I don't want to get in between him and Matt as they continue to have a great time. So I'm going to go into kind of producer status. I'm going to turn my camera off, but Mike, I wanted to say hello. Welcome to the show. Hey, really appreciate you guys having me on. And uh, I, guess, uh, I guess it's time to lock the we gate. We have an right? audio problem. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> you guys got me? You there? I hear you. You got me. Okay, cool. Good. All right. Mike Sanford joins us here on Zero to 60. Thank you to uh, Bree Maces for helping us with the te technical difficulties there. What's up, dog? How are you? And uh, happy Monday. You staying warm up there? God, it's awful outside right now. Hey, man. It's uh, it's good shredding weather. So about time the mountains got some got some of the good snur that needed to show up here pretty soon. So, yeah, doing well, man. We Actually, I was going to go take my family up today. They have school off today and tomorrow, um, but uh, I-70 is all jammed up, so we couldn't even get up there. Can't go shred. That sucks. But, hey, at least you get a snow day, so that's a good thing. Now, now look, uh, the playoff games this weekend were, you know, three of them were – or two of them were eh. – I know that the Green Bay game, you were probably jumping through the, the, the damn roof watching your guy play, and that's really what I want to focus on here is Jordan Love and the way the Packers do things – and what you saw out of that young man this weekend going into Dallas, they haven't lost a home game in two years, and he didn't just, like, beat them. He shredded them, and he's playing at such a high level. What is it about Jordan Love that that has taken, you know, that, that that is one humble kid to sit on the bench for that long knowing he's this good, and now to playing at this level? Just talk about your guy. Jordan's uh, he's one of one. And I say that um, having really been around some pretty impressive quarterbacks, um, you know, Andrew Luck at Stanford, who, you know, it's hard to find a, a better supercomputer in the brain than Andrew Luck at the quarterback position. Um, and then the physical aspects of his game. But, you know, the thing about Jordan that, that I think stands out um, is just what's between his ears. And it's, you know, almost like what JJ McCarthy does in front of all the cameras uh, before every game sitting in the end zone and getting his Zen on. That's what Jordan uh, Jordan Love's baseline is. Like that's who that's who he is. He doesn't need he doesn't need any pep talks to get to work. Um, he also doesn't need you know you to calm him down before a game. He's just uh, he's cooler than the other side of the pillow, as Stuart Scott used to say. I mean that's who he is. He's he's a guy that approaches the work. You would love him, Ches. Um, you know, as a guy that has committed your your life to you know bettering the the you know the craft of offensive line, def defensive line play, linebacker play. You know, Jordan loves like the perfect pupil uh, because he's a sponge. He loves learning. Um, he never feels like he has it, but he's also one of those guys that's not insecure to think that I can't go out and execute if I don't have every single thing, you know, in my in my tool bag. Uh, he's really gifted as a natural passer, uh, super athletic. And it's funny, um, watching CJ Stroud play also uh, this weekend. Uh, I was at Utah State and ironically, you know, uh, I was there 2019, so it ended up being the year that Jordan Love was drafted. Um, and so we were looking for a quarterback, the next quarterback to to fill those shoes uh, in Logan. And um, I, so I was out and evaluating quarterbacks. And uh, one of my best friends, who's the offensive line coach at the time, now at BYU, TJ Woods, he's an Inland Empire guy, grew up in Southern California. And he slid over this, this, this tall, underdeveloped, skinny 
quarterback, you know, hey, this this guy kind of reminds me a little bit of Jordan, and it was C.J. Stroud. Um, and so I fell in love with C.J. Stroud, offered him, and it's funny because when you watch the two of them play, there's a lot of similarities. They both have really gifted lower halves. Um, they're very loose. They're smooth. Um, they, they can extend the play, but it's almost like they, they, they'll take the first play if it's there. Uh, and then the second play stuff that you see for both those guys, just so fun to watch because it's, 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 it's almost like it's easy to them. Uh, the game just naturally comes to them. So uh, I think that we're seeing a, uh, a passing of the baton in the National Football League at the quarterback position, you know, from, you know, some of these, I'd call them power quarterbacks, the Jalen Hurts, uh, you know, Josh Allen. Uh, and now the passing of the baton is going to these, you know, these smooth, you know, uh, kind of just smooth operators that are great passers, can play the traditional game, but can also play this new game of the second play. And I think Jordan Love and C.J. Stroud are those two guys that are going to be doing this for a long time. That's what you just said it so, you know, perfectly. It's easy. And from the minute I turned the game on the other day, that's what it looked like. Green Bay's offense was just out there executing easily against Dan Quinn's defense in Dallas. The number two seed, the, you know, these, these young Packers walk in there. They don't know, you know, they're ass from a hole in the ground. They're all just a bunch of babies out there playing. Look, I know on top of being a great coach and, you know, coaching everywhere and having allegiances everywhere, at heart you're a Boise State Bronco, and I know you're a huge Packer fan. What is it about Green Bay? How, how do they keep doing this? I mean, I understand that they have a great foundation, but they've rotated out Brett Favre, Aaron Rodgers, and now Jordan Love three in a row. They're constantly competitive. They are always putting themselves in position where if they have a down year, the next year they're back in the playoffs. I and mean, they've got the youngest roster in football. And it's – is it just the, you know, hungry and humble, you know, mid Midwestern mindset that just resonates in Green Bay and that they just consistently know that their process leads to this huge prize? What is it about the Packers that has them rolling like this for going on three decades now? You know, Chez, I was uh, I was able to take my family out to a to a Packers game at Lambeau this year, and it ended up being a game where I think the season really, really it, it changed on that Sunday at Lambeau Field. It was earlier in the season against the Chargers, and uh, one of my really good friends, the assistant offensive line coach Ryan Mahaffey at Green Bay, and he was awesome to give my family a tour of the stadium, kind of get to know, you know, the you know, kind of the inner workings of Green Bay, and. It was, it was really unique getting his insight as a guy that he coached on my staff uh, when I was a head coach at Western Kentucky, and he was at Notre Dame with me. But just getting his insight about what makes Green Bay so different, it's their ownership structure. It, it's, it's owned by the fans. It, it really is. like it's, it's traded on the public stock market. And what Ryan Mahaffey told me, it, it really opened my eyes to how this has been a reality You know, with really patience and continuity you know, in, in the Packers organization for so long, he had a quote for me that I thought was really unique. He said, you know, sometimes when we want things done really fast, you know, this isn't the place to get things done really fast because there's a board. Uh, there's no one owner. There's not one super Jerry Jones type guy that's going to make these massive decisions and, and snap his fingers. And all of a sudden Mike McCarthy and Dak Prescott are on the streets looking for a job. Um, this is voted on by Packers fans that own a, a share in this franchise you know, even the president of the organization is just a fan that has a has more stock options and has been vested longer than the rest of the fans. Um, you know, so decisions aren't made uh, haphazardly. And Chez, I think in this crazy day and age that we live in in football and in our society, everybody wants change right now, right? And the Packers organization is forced to not have the ability to make change right now all the time. And I think as a result of that, you're starting to see this homegrown aspect of players that are drafted into this organization. They live in a town in Green Bay, at least during the season. I don't think any of them really live there in the offseason. You could probably uh, speak to that with Bakhtiari, uh, not being a, a full-time resident of Green Bay, I'm guessing. But, uh, you know, it's a place that has limited distractions. You know, it's all about the football. And it does remind me a little bit of Boise State. You know, when I went to Boise 25 years ago as a freshman quarterback, dude, there were no distractions. It was a small town. You know, and it was, a, it was a program that wasn't trying to go out and get transfers and graduate transfers. It was trying to just bring them in, develop them, and focus on the, mo the most important thing, and that's getting better at your dang craft. And I think that's exactly what's been going on in Green Bay for three decades, and it really is fun to watch. I wasn't a Packer fan growing up, 
In fact, I've been looking for an NFL team to be rooting for. My dad coached at the San Diego Chargers when I was uh, a high schooler. Um, and then he got fired. So I hate the Chargers. They could suck it. Um, but, uh, you know, the Packers just became a team that I wanted to jump right in with because of Jordan Love. And as I got around this franchise, uh, my sons are just diehard Packers fans. My daughter, my wife, uh, in the last three years, we've been watching this team really closely. Uh, been around the team hotel, been around guys like Aaron Jones. And it really is a, fam a family type of, of an environment and really fun team to root for. Uh, and I think they're going to be really good for a long, long period of time. Yeah, I think they're going to be special uh, moving forward. That that roster is young and fast and hungry. I don't know if they're going to be able to pay all those freaks, but hey, you know, the, I, again, the way that they draft and develop is crazy. I, look, I, I played there twice, and then you know, I, I remember I went on a, a workout there, uh, and <laughs> it was the first time I've ever been to Green Bay, and it took like four flights to get there and a little like double seat chopper plane. I thought we were going to die. And I, we pull in, and I get off the plane. And they pick me up, and they drive me into Green Bay. And it's like, it's like, hey, the suburbs. Oh, there's a nice little house. And then boom, Lambo. And you're like, what the hell is going on across the street from Lambo's? Like, just some dude neighborhood. Yeah, it's a, it's a neighborhood <laughs> right there. I mean, it's it's the most unique place I think I've ever been. Uh, from a perspective of like, you know, you go around all the, the metro areas in the country, everybody's got, a, you know, a, a megaplex. But this this is like nothing and then the mecca of professional football. And just they they do it right in, at Green Bay. Let me ask you this, Coach, and, and the great Mike Sanford joins us here on Zero to 60 on the Believe Network. Uh, I'm your host, Matt McChesney. And Bree Macis, my co-host, brought this up earlier, but – Quarterback salaries in the National Football League are going one way, and that's up. Now, the salary cap, I don't know if it's adjusting correctly to the fact that sometimes 35% of your salary is, is, is capped to one dude. You know, that quarterback's getting paid all this bread, you know, and it kind of hamstrings the team to go do something they may want to do to build. How do you, how do you think this is going to go? I mean, Tua Tungavailoa is up for contract. Is he worth $50 million a year? I mean, I, I don't see that. So are they going to start paying cats on what they are rather than the pay scale? Or is the pay scale just going to go one way and you're going to see, you know, Danny Dimes getting paid $45 million. I'm <laughs> glad he got paid, but shit, Daniel Dimes, $45 million? Make it make sense. Well, first off, yeah, Danny Dimes, uh, you know, his uh, his failed contract and, and his awful play getting off that massive deal, it did lead, it gave way to the, one of the greatest uh, fairy tales in, in New York, New Jersey history, and that's my man, Tommy Cutlets. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was there for that game, the Monday night football game. My wife and I went to the Packers. Uh, uh, it was, a, it was, I was rooting for the Packers, but just seeing, 65,000 Italian Americans in one building just at the same time doing this was, it was actually too good to be true. Uh, one of the best uh, sports memories I've ever been around, even if it lasted for two weeks. But, you know, I think that uh, a critical piece of the puzzle as it relates to giving quarterbacks these massive deals versus drafting and, and starting cost controlled quarterbacks is going to be what the Denver Broncos do. Like this is going to be so incredibly important. And then the results I think will end up being a trend for the league. And so if it's go out and, and sign Dak Prescott here in, in Denver to a big deal, I, I, I don't know how you can do that. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how the fan base would receive yeah. that. And then you've got dead money with Russell Wilson. Don't think that the Cowboys are going to try to fix their uh, woes with Russell Wilson at the helm. Uh, but I, I think that the Broncos need to go the route of, of, of finding a, a CJ Stroud in this draft. And C.J. Stroud wasn't the number one quarterback drafted in, in last year's draft. It was Bryce Young. I mean, Bryce Love, excuse me. I always say Bryce Young. No, Bryce Young. Yeah, Bryce well, Love was, yeah, yeah. He was yeah. the running back at Stanford that I recruited. But uh, cool. he was pretty fast. He could go. But, um, you know, just seeing what C.J. Stroud's meant to that Texans uh, organization and franchise and then D'Amico Ryan's being the guy that has, I think, just been the perfect mentor for a young quarterback. He's young himself. You know, he's not trying to control everything that C.J. Stroud does, lets him be himself. I think that Matt LaFleur is doing the same thing with Jordan Love. Even though Jordan Love isn't technically a rookie, by all, you know, he, he came out right, after right. his third year 
Uh, he, was, he was a young cat. He needed time to develop. I knew that. I knew that he would develop, but I also knew that he wasn't a ready-made NFL starter. And I think that you're seeing a guy right now in this draft, and I'm a huge fan of him, uh, is, is Michael Penix Jr. Uh, I think Bo Nix is also an interesting guy himself. But the two of them, they both have experience. They both have gone through a ton of adversity in their own careers to get them to the point that now they're 23 years old. That's the same age that Jordan Love is by year, you know, give or take. But I think that you're you want to get a cost controlled quarterback, especially in this in this era of of dead cap space. I don't know if you know this, the Green Bay Packers are carrying seventy million dollars right now in dead cap space. I mean, and and so how do you find the solution? Just look to the freaking Packers. They have a cost controlled quarterback. Now, is that going to last for a long time? No. But by the time all of their dead cap comes off the books, Jordan Love will then be in position to get his contract. And that's exactly what I think the Denver Broncos need to do is they need to hit on this quarterback. They can't go the route of free agency. I don't see it being a possibility. They'll eat up any other opportunities to, to get some playmakers around this, this next quarterback. I think the key has to be finding somebody in this draft. Okay, so look, Bree and I were just talking about this as well. She's a massive Tom Brady fan. I don't know how you can't be. I mean, I I even played against the guy and like wanted to smash his face, but shit. He's and then the, ask for his autograph. He's the go be like, hey, can I get your jersey, bro? And like like two I did to Mahomes the other night. That I don't know how I feel about like asking your well, that's a different conversation for a different day. But let me ask you this. And and this is a this is a tricky question. Put yourself in in you know a, a young quarterback's shoes. He's about to get his first massive contract, his second contract. He's gone through four or five years of starting. He's proved it. They've won playoff games, maybe won a Super Bowl. Things are good. You want to maximize your dollars because you want to get some FU money. But if you look at like the most successful quarterback that's ever played the game, Tom Brady was never even in the top 10 of paid quarterbacks in his career ever. Like, I think the highest he was was maybe 13th or 14th. He would constantly take lesser money. He would live off of endorsements. He would give the team flexible contract, you know, uh, uh, opportunities with him so that New England could go out and spend on other positions. As a young quarterback, if you're, if you're Jordan Love and you go, okay, I might be able to take less to get more do you think that that's way, a way that like some of these young guys are going to be thinking moving forward? Or is it always going to be just, I need to maximize my money as much as possible where some of these guys are making $70 million a year when you've got other guys making league men? Spring, you bring up a really good point. And, and Chez, you know, you, fr from your own experience, having been with agents, oftentimes the agent themselves is an issue um, with regards to being able to take a lesser deal. Mm -hmm. Because these agents all, they get their own worth and their own market value based off the contracts they negotiate for their, their clients. Um, but, you know, if you're Tom Brady, then you can tell your agent to go shove it and I'm going to do what I need to do because my legacy matters more than the dollars. And then on the flip side of that, Chez, I'd ask you, if you decide to take a max contract as a quarterback and, you're, and it doesn't go well, how fun is that? Ask Russell Wilson. Yeah, how fun sure. is how fun has these two years been in Denver? Shitty. Outs, outside of opening up a you know a Sierra and Russ store in the Denver airport, it hadn't been very fun. I haven't been a lot of uh, earmark moments for old Russ and Sierra here in Denver. In fact, I'll be I bet they're on the first flight out of town as as fast as they get. He gets on to do a new, a new team, but I, I think that this is the way to go. I, I, Chez, I think it's the way to go. I don't think it's you know giving the team the ultimate sweetheart deal because. You, you know as well as anybody that your window to make money in the National Football League is so small, right? It, it's it's somewhere between four and 12 years if you're a, a starting quarterback, you know, and, and a 12-year career is, is a very long, you know, illustrious type of a career. But I do think that your, your second, third, fourth contracts, I think those types of contracts are those – that's the long money contracts that, that give you – what you need after your career and the way you get to those contracts is by building a legacy. And how do you build a legacy by having a great supporting cast? So I'm, I'm hundred percent on board with the Tom Brady uh, decision to do what he did, but you do have to make sure that your endorsement deals are rolling. Like right now it's funny, man. Jordan love has very little endorsement right now. I think you will after these playoffs, especially if, he, 
especially if he goes and does what he what what I think they're going to do and and find a way to win in San Francisco Woo! or Santa Clara. You bet you better believe it. You just um, said it. Well, okay, so how how? And this is the last question I'll ask you about, uh, and and then we'll we'll get you out of here. How 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 do the Packers go to Santa Clara and beat? I, I bet you San Francisco's a, 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 at least a touchdown favorite. I, you know, they are loaded. They got dudes everywhere. They've only had playoff failure. They're hungry. You know, that group is not going to be around forever. They know that their window is going to close here eventually, too, as Green Bay's window is opening. You, you just said it. Green Bay goes to San Francisco and finds a way to get a dub. That means Detroit might be hosting the NFC title game, for God's sakes. How does that happen? How does Jordan Love go to go, go to San Francisco and get a dub? Convince me so I can make some money. Well, first off, I don't think anybody thought that they were going to do it this past uh, yesterday, nice. right? I mean, that was uh, no, – but, but if you look at the last nine games of, of this Packers season and particularly look at Jordan Love, uh, that nine-game stretch, 7-2 uh, and two has been the record. Uh, Jordan Love has 20 touchdowns to one interception. You know, with three games remaining, it's okay. not – if the Packers find a way to get this thing done and continue what they've started, it's not out of the question for him to go on an unprecedented streak – of even 30 touchdowns to one interception because there's three remaining games to win the Super Bowl. I know it sounds crazy. Uh, I know they're nine and a half point dogs, but the thing that people haven't really, I think, done a good enough job of following this Packers team is their health has been atrocious throughout the course of this year. And Jordan Love has, has made other receivers and tight ends around him that were no names better. And that's the mark of a great quarterback is that you make other, other guys that nobody knows about you make them better. And that's what didn't happen here in Denver. Russ never found that young player and made a name for that young player. It was, it was Cortland Sutton. That was it. That was his guy. And you look at what Jordan Love's done. I mean, who had heard of Dontavian Wicks and Tucker Kraft <laughs> and, and even A.J. Dillon? I mean, A.J. Dillon had an unbelievable run there midseason. But what I'd say is how is this going to get done? The Packers have gotten healthy. This is the first game against the Dallas Cowboys since the beginning of the year where they've had their starters starting. And that's even without one of the greatest left tackles of all time, David Bakhtiari playing, yeah. you know, at all this season, really. Uh, you, you have Christian Watson coming back to health. You've got Dontavian Wicks, Jaden Reed, Tucker Kraft, Luke Musgraves missed eight games since the Broncos game. Right after that, I think it was the Chargers game. Luke Musgraves, the, the, the top tight end drafted out of Oregon State. And, and you could see even him getting implemented back into, into this, this lineup. I think that this is a really young team. It doesn't bring all those veteran lump, lumps into week 19 of a season that I think some of the 49ers will. Plus, I think it's a disadvantage at times to have, have, a, have a buy in the first round. You know, the, the Packers are coming off playing really good football. They have confidence. They're rolling. They're in the routine. The, you know, they get back to their facility and straight back to work. It's short week. Get right back at it. They came out of the game healthy. I, I, I think that there, there's going to be some noise made in San Francisco, and nobody's going to expect it. Uh, Vegas isn't expecting it. But if you watch this season, the last nine games, the Packers are 7-2. and two, And Jordan Love has outdueled in that time. He's outdueled Herbert. He's outdueled Mahomes. He outdueled Dak Prescott. And he's outdueled Justin Fields. You can say you don't like him or not, but he outdueled him on the road. Uh, I think that, that this is a, a really good time uh, for the Packers to do something nobody's expecting them to do, and that's get a win in Santa Clara. Love it, man. All right, so uh, we'll get you out of here on this one. We'll just go real quick here. Buffalo and Pittsburgh are today in Orchard Park. I, I think the Bills take care of business. Thoughts? Josh Allen is a bad weather uh, weapon. I mean, just his ability to create the second play, to run through, uh, you know, whatever is in his way. Josh Allen's going to just will this team to victory. I don't think Mason Rudolph's going to be the guy today uh, that's going to find a way to get the Steelers a dub. No, nah, uh, and especially with T.J. Watt not being on the field. At least we'll have a nice snow game. That's going to be fun. Uh, I always like a, a good weather game. And then, and you know, and then you got the nightcap. You've got Baker Mayfield hosting a, a playoff game tonight with Tampa bringing in the Eagles. The Eagles and Nick Sirianni have been average since, you know, starting the season 10 and one, they finished the season 11 and six. Uh, where do you think that one goes? I think it's going to be Tampa. I think home field advantage is going to play a huge role in this Baker Mayfield. Uh, you know, everybody, he's almost, uh, he, he's like, um, 
He's like a cult hero, but he's also kind of a, a joke to many people. This dude's thrown for 4,000 yards and 28 touchdowns. I mean, he threw for 1,000 more yards than Russell Wilson did. So Baker Mayfield's doing some really good things. I think they're they're finding ways to win games. Uh, he's been playing, I think, playoff winning caliber football throughout the course of the, the second half of the season. Uh, I think that the Eagles are in trouble. I think Nick Sirianni's in trouble. I think that they've shown in the past after a Super Bowl or two years after a Super Bowl to move on from a coach. I think right. Jalen Hurts' his finger is going to be an issue. Uh, I, I think that, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see Tampa win this game by two scores. It wouldn't surprise me one bit. Yeah, Jalen Hurts. His fingers hurt. Well, now his back's going to hurt because he just pulled landscaping duty. So, all right, brother. Uh, the great Mike Sanford joins us here on Zero to 60. It was a pleasure having you on the show, bro. Have yourself a great snow day. Uh, stay warm up there and enjoy yourself some football. And all the best to you and your family. Thanks so much for coming on the show. And uh, we'll talk soon. Chez, before I get off here, man, just three words for you, bud. Yes. Lock the gates, baby. Lock, the gates. Lock, Lock them. them. Lock the gates. Lock the gates my guy right there have yourself a great day homie all right that's a wrap zero to 60 is rolling uh we'll be back tomorrow uh with coach jb and big schmitty joining me at 10 a.m uh brie and i will try and corral those two idiots that's uh, not happening no you're not gonna corral them with <laughs> oh me okay i'll corral God. them by myself uh, uh she can just she'll watch just she'll, she'll watch just what she'll watch so uh i'm your host matt mcchesney that is brie Mason. we're out enjoy your snow day peace <laughs>